As the way employees work becomes increasingly mobile and advanced threats put them at increasing risk, many organizations are moving away from appliances to cloud-based security solutions due to their greater scalability, lower cost, and complexity, and their ability to provide enhanced security for nomadic workers. But is this the right approach? In this webcast, David Ulovich, CEO and founder of OpenDNS, will explore limitations of security appliances and hybrid appliance cloud solutions and examine the risks and benefits of the cloud-based approach to security. And with this, let me introduce today's presenter, David Ulovich. Good morning, David. Thanks, Martin. Uh, and thanks for all of you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, as Martin mentioned, we're going to take a tour through you know, the way we think uh, security has evolved and changed and the, the threats and issues that uh, our customers and IT administrators like yourself face. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time to do Q&A. We can talk about uh, some of the products that, uh, and solutions that we deliver here at OpenDNS, and I'm excited to uh, go through this with you. I expect it's going to be about 20 minutes of presentation, uh, and then we'll leave 10, 15 minutes of uh, Q&A, depending on what we need. Uh, and again, I appreciate all of you taking the time to join us. So without further ado, I think most of you are familiar with you know, what has been what I would say is the status quo uh, in enterprise uh, security for the last 25 years. Historically, you've seen that uh, the IT department has had local networks where people were connecting. The data generally resided on your network, so you had file servers, maybe a little server room in a closet, uh, or even a, a mini data center in your, your enterprise environment. And all the data that you cared about that you had to protect was local to your network. And when you thought about how to secure that, you really just had to build those walls around it. You put up a firewall, uh, you had a gateway, and things were pretty easy. Moreover, you generally had access to control all the devices. So not only did you control the network and the data resided on premise, but you also controlled all the devices that were connecting to the network. Uh, so that means people were provisioned their own laptops, uh, their own desktops, uh, and even in the cases when they had a phone, generally that was handed out by the, the corporation itself, whether it was a BlackBerry that connected back to the BlackBerry Exchange server. But essentially everything happened within that castle. If you think of your enterprise network as the castle, everything happened within, and very few things happened externally. When, when you did have people that were at home and they needed to access resources, they would often VPN in, right? So they would have secure connectivity into your network. And again, these, all these things happened through one or two choke points in and out of your network. So it was a pretty easy uh, environment to control and people would securely connect back to your corporate network, access the data they needed, and then they'd be off and on their way. You know, this, this paradigm, when we think of network security, has really been, uh, what people have been taught as best practices for the last 25 years. You put up your firewalls around your data, around your devices, around your users, and then you just, you know, put in these, you know, you build moats around it, you put in your then, you then have these choke points on your network where you can put in your firewall, your intrusion detection system, uh, and you basically have a place to get central visibility into everything that's happening. So as IT administrators, as security practitioners, you then had a singular place where you could tap into the network and place, you know, what we sort of describe as the bump on the wire and you could then route your traffic, you could look at your traffic, and you can monitor all the communication going in and out of your network. And things were generally pretty easy. That, that trend allowed you to very quickly respond to threats. So you'd have an appliance, if, let's say you had a security appliance. Uh, you had things like the Melissa virus, the Code Red worm, things that were wide-reaching, uh, that impacted millions of people all at once. They were not highly targeted, they were not highly specific. And so these you know, appliance-based security models worked really, really well. People would get updates for these generic uh, worms that, in fact, in many cases, when you think of things back in the day, for those of you that have been doing security a while, for things like Code Red or NIMDA or Melissa, these were things that we knew were going to happen, we knew when they were going to happen, uh, and the AV community had a really good handle on these things, and it was really easy to block these things on the network when you had one or two choke points in and out of your, your environment. Uh, so again, pretty easy to deal with, and that made a lot of sense. We, there was a time when having an appliance Having a bump on the wire and the one or two uh, egress points in your network made a tremendous amount of sense. It was cost effective and it protected all your users, all your data, and all your devices. Our, our view today is that the way people do work has changed. And as a result, we take a look at the security appliance model and we say, okay, let's take some of those best practices and apply it to how people actually do work today because we think that there's a place where appliances have sort of lost their edge. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. So let's introduce the idea of cloud computing, a term that many of you talk about, have heard about. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
in the context of security, the way I view it is really it's the migration of your data, whether it's deliberate or indeliberate, uh, of, your, of your, your company data, your confidential proprietary data, moving off of your premise and into the cloud. So as people use services like Salesforce, where they store all their customer data that's super valuable, super important, where they use things like Dropbox, and maybe individual employees are using Dropbox on their own, or as a company, you've signed up for an enterprise uh, file collaboration service like Box. Uh, as you use those services, your data is now moving outside that corporate perimeter. And what that means is that some of those access controls you had before, that, that uh, castle wall that you built around your enterprise is no longer as effective as it once was because, of course, the data that you were trying to protect no longer resides inside your corporate network. Moreover, and I know this won't be a surprise to any of you, uh, but mobility has increased dramatically, which means people now have multiple devices, they have multiple screens, and many of these screens and devices are their own. So they're demanding that they're able to access their email, and that, that, that uh, that bridge has already been, been crossed, right? So people now access email from remote devices that are no longer provisioned by IT. And while, of course, there are some organizations that maybe have such an exceptionally high bar for security that they still provision devices and they still mandate how people access their email, moreover, people are moving to even things like Google Apps, where their email, even their email is moving to the cloud, uh, or they've had to open up secure access to email from outside the corporate network. And it's just, it's just that bridge has, has been crossed but what we're seeing now is that access to data, customer data, proprietary financial and confidential information, file sharing, uh, CRM data, et cetera, is also moving to the cloud. And then when you combine that with the fact that people are using these devices, both inside the corporate network and outside the corporate network, you've really changed the paradigm of what those appliances used to do. And so when we talk about appliances losing their effectiveness, it's not that the appliances just stopped working. It's more like the tree that falls in the forest that no one's around to hear. When your traffic that you care about monitoring and managing is no longer going in and out of that bump on the wire that you have at your corporate perimeter, the box is unable to do uh, what it does best, which is protect you. So it's not that it's lost its effectiveness, it's really that the traffic's not going through it and therefore it's not being used and that's really what we talk about when we, when we say that they've lost their effectiveness. There's another trend that I think most people don't think about and don't talk about, which is that on your corporate network, people now might be using cellular access to access files and services remotely. So they may have, you may have multiple networks inside your, your company. So this idea that you could build an enterprise network and treat it like a castle with castle walls and only have one or two egress points in your network, again, no longer applies. There's lots of people now that even have uh, tablets or even sort of uh, netbook-like devices that have cellular connectivity and Wi-Fi connectivity. And in fact, there may be instances on your network where people are bridging uh, traffic between the two networks. So just because somebody's inside your office doesn't mean they're connecting to the corporate network and applying uh, your network-based security policies to that traffic. They could be using an iPad or an iPhone over a 3G, uh, 4G, LTE kind of connection and then accessing files that are stored in the cloud. And those things are happening outside of your purview, and that's visibility that's been lost. And so what this means for us is that, you know, the, those walls that you built up, the appliances, the, the choke points on your network where you've been able to get visibility into traffic, we feel like it's really been eroded and that people are focusing on ways they route around things that they find to be difficult or frustrating, uh, and in fact, they bypass them however, however they can. And more often than not, even if you have a corporate VPN, we're finding, and in fact, our company here is even a decent example of this. Oftentimes, I find that our, our salespeople here don't need to connect to the corporate network because they use Salesforce, the emails on Google Apps, and they really have very little need to physically connect to our wired network. They just use the Wi-Fi. And in fact, they even use the guest Wi-Fi because it's easier than connecting to the corporate, you know, 802.1x authenticated Wi-Fi. So as a result, visibility has been eroded. People don't need to use a VPN because the data that they're accessing is not behind the corporate firewall, it's in the cloud. Uh, and again, this idea that you've lost visibility means you've lost the ability to apply policy and ultimately you've lost some control. And you know, I think if, if we view our jobs and our roles as IT people as being able to sort of protect the, the confidential data and the proprietary data of a company, that job has been made much, much harder uh, with the sort of this, this uh, ephemeral perimeter or this amorphous perimeter that no longer really exists, you no longer have those choke points on your network. And I think that we can all agree that the, the solution is not to just ban all these devices. People tried that, you know, a year or two, a couple years ago. 
Uh, and it just doesn't work. People will route around it. You'll find your sales organization will just sign up for Salesforce on their own. The marketing teams will sign up for their own cloud-based services. And I think that IT has a real opportunity to, instead of uh, just trying to be draconian and, and block all these things, instead to say, hey, look, how can we create a secure way of accessing these services and do so in a way that also addresses the, the changing uh, threat landscape? So that brings me to another point here, which is that the threats that we see today are generally threats that we've never seen before. And that may sound like a bizarre thing to say, but it is true that if you think back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a lot of worms were not so sophisticated, they were not as polymorphic, they didn't change. I mean, I think now some of the AV companies are saying that they detect up to a thousand different variants of malware per day. I mean, those are crazy, crazy numbers, and granted that many of them are, are very similar and are just uh, iterations of, of established malware. The reality is that there are new threats coming up today that we've never seen before, and people are looking for ways to both uh, prevent being infected, be able to better detect when they are infected, and then be able to mitigate infections once, they're, uh, once they've been surfaced and, and identified. So, you know, so when we, when we put this all together, our thesis here at, at OpenDNS, uh, and where we've gone with launching our umbrella security services, is that we think of the appliance model as something that really made a lot of sense when all the data, all the people, and all the devices were inside the corporate castle. Uh, the reality is, though, that people want to do work wherever they need to get work done, and as a result, they're going to eat work from home. They're going to work from the open Wi-Fi at the airport, from at Starbucks, and work is no longer necessarily just a place that you go. It's it's really much more. It's a thing that you do, uh, especially for the kind of customers that uh, that we work with and the kind of organizations that you work for. Uh, you know that it's hard to force those users to use local VPNs, uh, to back all their traffic. It creates performance issues. And when the data that they need to access is not behind the corporate network, they're not going to do it. So what is that? What is that? What are the sort of the consequences of these things? So if you have your appliance-based solution, and we talk about the fact that, you know, a lot of times people would pair up network-based security uh, with host-based security. So I, I describe endpoint security and host-based security as the same thing. So think of, you know, sort of McAfee, AVG, Norton on the desktop, uh, things that would protect your desktop from in infections that maybe come in via USB or an email attachment that the network-based security didn't detect. That doesn't work very well today when you have so many new devices and operating systems, whether it's Android, iOS, uh, or anything else that's coming out, where endpoint software hasn't yet been developed. Uh, and certainly, even if it has been developed, it's not nearly mature enough to really prevent threats. And so if your only solution to pri trying to do security for smartphones and mobile and roaming devices is to rely on endpoint security, you'll find that it's lacking. You lack visibility as to what's happening with your network traffic. And I think that for those of you that have run, uh, whether it's a source fire kind of based IDS or any intrusion detection system or any other kind of network based security solution, you know that being able to very quickly aggregate traffic from across your network and seeing what's happening and what are the traffic patterns and what users are doing what and being able to very quickly apply filtering policy is a key tenant of a sound security practice. And that's just not possible as people are accessing corporate data on the road. Uh, and then, of course, there's other issues around battery life and latency. We often find that when we talk to our customers or, they t or we talk to the employees of our customers, uh, and we ask them if they use the corporate VPN, because many of you have corporate VPNs, but we ask if the, if the employees are using them, it turns out that the employees often won't use the, the VPN. And the reason is that if the VPN, let's say it's located in New York, and the employees traveling to Tokyo or to San Francisco, all that additional latency impacts performance, and use, employees don't like it. One of the solutions that IT people have come out with to try to deal with that is even a, a worse security practice, which is this idea of called a split tunnel VPN. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with what that means. Generally, a split tunnel VPN is a solution where only the traffic that needs to go to the corporate network goes through the VPN, the rest of it's routed directly to the internet. The reason those are such a bad idea is that people will often be infected, whether it's through a third-party ad network or a drive-by download or a PDF exploit or a flash exploit. So then they get infected because their traffic's not going through your security appliance on the corporate network. And instead, what's happening is that they get infected and then their traffic is now going into the corporate network where they're able to infect other hosts. So the idea of a split tunnel VPN being somehow of a, a compromise to increase performance for users uh, really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because it's really just creating a vector into your network, uh, an untrusted vector into your network. Uh, so to me, it's really the worst of, of both worlds. 
there's some other issues that we find with the appliance model, and, and this particularly relates to uh, the pace in which new threats are being discovered and the pace at which new threats are being deployed by bad guys around the world. So we now see that a domain can be registered and within minutes be, uh, being used by botnet command and control, botnet operators uh, as ways of directing traffic to their command and control servers. And these things happen in the order of minutes. In fact, the domains can be created in minutes, used in minutes, and then shut down minutes later, never to be used again. And so if you're relying on a security appliance that gets me, nowadays some of them even try to update every hour. You know, they used to just do nightly updates, but now they try to update every hour. It's just not sufficient because there's, there's threats that can come and go within that hour that started and ended already before you even tried to do your security update. And when, you know, an enterprise has thousands of appliances deployed or even a vendor, let's th think of it from a vendor standpoint, Let's say you're a vendor that has tens of thousands of customers and appliances deployed around the world. Pushing out updates in a continuous fashion is not what they've been designed to do, and it creates issues uh, around pushing out protection very quickly. So when you're using a cloud-based security solution, and we'll talk about this more in just a moment, uh, you generally don't have the same issue because the area where you're doing the research and the data analysis is the same place you want to apply filtering, and you can then roll that out continuously in real time. And then this is one of the ones that really sort of, uh, I would say, grinds my gears, if I can reference family, family Guy. Uh, when people talk about secure web gateways and trying to look and inspect traffic and, and apply security policy, most of the secure web gateways out there only look at HTTP traffic. Uh, sometimes they look at HTTPS traffic, although that actually is uh, on the decline. And the reality is the bad guys know this, and they don't rely on HTTP or HTTPS traffic. They're using IRC, they're using all kinds of other protocols and ports to send traffic and send confidential data and leak information out of your corporate network. So if your secure web gateway is only looking at port 80 traffic because it's a proxy, we find that that's wholly insufficient, particularly in preventing infected hosts from phoning home. It's not horrible. It's, I mean, it's okay for blocking people from being infected when you know about a, something that, that is malicious. But if you want to prevent people from phoning home and leaking out your corporate data, which is equally, if not more important, than blocking them from the original infection, uh, then you have to have a solution in place that's port agnostic and protocol agnostic. So then, one of the issues that we find from customers who are buying appliances is that they don't know how, how to size their appliance, especially around uh, the usage. So think of the fact that you know five years ago YouTube was uh, you know hardly on the radar. And I think now there's people that speculate that uh, things like YouTube and video come from, you know account for the majority of traffic on the internet today. Uh, so high bandwidth services, if you're trying to run those things through a proxy, what ends up happening is you look at your network capacity and you know that you know if you want to have an appliance that's going to run for three or four years. Looking back, you'll know that the connectivity at your office has probably increased dramatically in that same amount of time. So it's very hard to size and provision a hardware-based appliance for the capacity that you're going to need tomorrow, the next year, or the year after. Moreover, if you want to start carrying uh, lots of other traffic, let's say you want to start backhauling all your mobile users because you want them to go through your corporate appliance, or let's say your vendor rolls out new security functionality that's going to lower performance. So not only do you need to then carry more traffic, uh, and be able to provide people a lower latency connection. But as you add functionality to your appliance over time, you're going to end up finding out that adding that functionality to a hardware-based appliance that so has some limited performance capacity will eventually decrease its overall throughput. Uh, and what that ends up with is frustrated end users, and then we know what happens with frustrated end users. They find ways to route around it. Uh, they either use a different service, they stop using the VPN, uh, or, they, or they find their work to be frustrating eventually. You know, in Silicon Valley, I'm sure people would just find a new job if their internet wasn't fast enough. That may not, people may not have that luxury elsewhere. Uh, but certainly we know it's the case that if you have to buy an appliance, it's hard to self-provision an appliance that is going to have the capacity to scale for the next three to five years. And a lot of you we know when we talk to our customers, try to buy an appliance. They, they're going to be able to have it racked and stacked for three years. Otherwise, it's too complicated to constantly rip out appliances. I'm taking a water break here. Okay. So we, uh, one of the things that we've seen in our success with OpenDNS and, and building what we believe is going to be the world's largest security network is that when we talk to customers that have you know, 10 offices, 20 offices, 50 offices, 100 offices, in fact, some of our customers have even more than that or in the thousands of offices, 
The idea of maintaining multiple security boxes around their network and deploying them to all their offices is a total disaster. And there's a number of reasons why, essentially, I would say this stinks. And I think many of you know what they are. It's, it's a headache from a management standpoint, right? So you, there's, there's the idea that you have to deploy, physically you have to deploy hardware. So it's an IT nightmare to ship out boxes. If one fails, you need to have a failover box. So if you have 400 offices, you basically need to have 800 appliances, so two for each office, one for primary and one for failover. Uh, the ability to manage these appliances is a total nightmare. Generally, uh, depending on your vendor, there's not one UI to manage all your boxes. There's not one UI to deploy policy consistently across all these appliances. And in many cases, vendors have now come out with sort of add-ons or, or band-aids on top of this that allow you to, to manage and deploy policy across all these devices. But then you get into a reporting issue, and you want to look at reporting across all these devices, uh, and you want to aggregate all these reports across 400 offices. You want to see what are the traffic patterns looking like, what are the threats looking like, uh, and that's generally not possible. So even if there's ways to deploy policy consistently across all your devices and manage it all from one UI, usually the reporting is siloed per appliance. Uh, and that, that uh, generally turns out to be a pain point for most of our customers because they want to be able to quickly look at traffic across all of their uh, sites, all their offices, uh, and none of this even takes into consideration the fact that you still have no visibility into roaming and mobile workers, which, are, you know, from our perspective, is increasing a larger percentage of traffic uh, for, the, for the employees. So where does this take us? I think I've sufficiently uh, scared you into the, the world where the appliances are not uh, as effective as they need to be because they don't look at the traffic that really uh, matters to your business. And as this traffic leaves your network and is going to the cloud, you know, using these multiple devices, uh, we think that there's a better way to do things, particularly for distributed offices and for nomadic workers. And we define nomadic workers as people that are using both laptops in and out of the office, using them at home, and then using smartphones with either Wi-Fi or cellular connections. So let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that. So if we think about the world where a secure web gateway was the appliance you put at the choke point on your network as a bump in a wire, what is, you know, we, we try to think about what's a good analog for protecting your data in the cloud, and we've come up with this term that we see other people using out in the industry as well, this idea of a secure cloud gateway. The idea being we want to help you create a secure perimeter around all these cloud applications, all these devices, all of your distributed offices that really provides you a holistic and unified view of who's accessing your network resources, who's accessing your corporate data uh, from any device anywhere in the world. And so if you think of OpenDNS, uh, we have deployed data centers all over the world. We have oh, one moment here. Let me turn off my phone. Apologize for that. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. The, uh, the Secure Cloud, Cloud Gateway is a way of providing protection for all these devices anywhere in the world. So we've deployed a global network of data centers around the world. And the idea being that you don't want your employees after VPN back to their corporate headquarters if they're just going to be accessing data uh, on Salesforce, on Dropbox, on Google Apps. What you really want is for them to have the fastest way of accessing Google Apps, but to do so in a way where your security policy is still being applied in a uniform way. So imagine all the power and flexibility of your appliance, but now you're applying it to people that are accessing their cloud applications from any of their devices anywhere in the world, but you can still see what sites are they visiting, you can still apply policy, blocking, whether it's content filtering, malware protection, botnet protection, protecting them from being infected, preventing them from phoning home to known and planning controls, and really extending your perimeter to the cloud, which we feel is, is a key component now of any security strategy going forward is the idea that you only want to protect people when they're in the office. To me, it's like, uh, it's like wearing a seatbelt. You don't only wear your seatbelt some of the time or only when you go to the work. You wear your seatbelt all the time because you never know when there might be a threat. So the same idea applies to security. You want your security policies and best practices to be applied, whether your employees are at home, whether your employees are on the road, no matter what device they're using, you want it to be consistently applied everywhere. As I was mentioning before, one of the unique benefits of using a cloud-based security service is that the same place where traffic is being inspected and traffic is being analyzed allows us to use things, you know, we, we use here Hadoop and a number of other big data tools to very quickly analyze data from 50 million plus uh, customers that use OpenDNS 
to very quickly identify threats, but then those very same data centers were able to then block and apply policy that blocks threats before they ever infect your network and before they ever infect your devices, no matter where they are. So the idea that you want to do both the threat discovery and the enforcement of threats and, and the prevention of, of infections, uh, you want those things to happen in the same place because it allows threats to be detected very, very quickly and then eliminates the delay in when that protection gets applied. You know, when we talked about appliances and trying to do capacity planning, one of the things we often hear from customers is that they get extraordinarily frustrated when they buy a hardware appliance that maybe is good for up to 100 megabits per second, and then it turns out they turn on a bunch of features, like they want to do some deep packet inspection, or they want to do some high-level proxying of, of traffic, uh, or they want to do other kinds of content filtering or security analysis or sandboxing of, uh, of uh, executables. And then they find out that the performance of that box you know, degrades on its own just by turning on features. And so now maybe it's a box that only does 50 megabits per second worth of throughput. The problem is every year this insatiable demand for bandwidth increases and you, it, it you know, makes it very expensive to buy appliances that are way further out in terms of what you need than what you need today. So the idea of using a cloud-based security service is that you don't have to worry about sizing, you don't have to have hardware upgrade cycles, you don't have to worry about all those nightly updates. As your needs increase, the idea is that the cloud has hundreds or thousands of servers deployed, in our case I think we're now up to thousands of servers deployed that automatically are fully multi-tenant, fully shared, fully distributed, so that no matter where your users are, they're always going to be able to have a low latency connection to the internet. And you don't have to worry about what that throughput is, whether you have enough bandwidth for the employees uh, through, the, through the security solution you have in place. The idea is a cloud-based solution gives the power of the biggest box you could possibly buy all the way to the, to the littlest customer uh, and then scales up with them as their organization scales up. We like nothing more than to find out that our customers uh, have doubled their headcount, tripled their headcount. And then for us, it's just simply a matter of adding more seats. There's no, there's no need to rip out equipment, put in new appliances. Uh, there's none of those uh, painful or laborious processes. One of the key things that I think will really start to change over the next year or two, uh, and one of the key benefits of a cloud-based security solution, is that all of the logging is centralized. And so, that provides you benefits as an administrator because you're able to view reports, whether it's across roaming laptops, mobile devices, or all your distributed offices. So as an, as an administrator of your corporate network, it gives you tremendous visibility. But also, as a security company ourselves, we're able to very quickly look at threats as they happen on a global basis. Just the other day, we had a domain name that we were looking at where, and where I think they're putting together a blog post about this now, a domain name that didn't exist, was registered, and then a few minutes later, thousands of hosts from around the world all phoned home to this exact domain name that had never received a single DNS re request ever before. Thousands of unique hosts around the internet all made a single request all within the same few seconds to a known host that had previously been unknown. There are things that we're able to detect by aggregating data across millions of end users very, very quickly and able to turn that into protection very, very quickly. We're, we're then able to look at the things like that domain and say, well, what are the other domains that also point to that same IP address? What other hosts are connected to that IP address? And very quickly look at reputation data, put together our own reputation data around these domain names, around those IP addresses to quickly determine whether they're malicious or not. That kind of power is only possible when you're aggregating data at a very high level, very quickly analyzing it, and then pushing that protection out immediately to the same servers that are in those same data centers so that the security is pushed out immediately, it's real time, as real time as you can get. Uh, and you're harnessing the power, sort of the collective wisdom of everybody's security data, and able, you know, in order to provide protection for yourself. And that, that to me, is a fundamental shift in security that even lends itself to being able to be predictive security uh, and not just purely reactive security. <clears throat> we certainly have noticed a bunch of vendors that have taken the model of what we what we call a Franken Cloud solution which is essentially the idea of taking the appliance and just moving it into the cloud, where you can manage it through the web, but fundamentally there's still one appliance for one customer. Maybe, maybe they've virtualized the appliance, so they, they put a few customers on one box, but it's not a multi-tenant solution. And in fact, even some of our biggest competitors have, have essentially taken this model, where customers hard code to a, you know, their, their traffic to a specific proxy or a specific data center, 
uh, if their employees are roaming around the world, those, those employees have to backhaul their traffic again, but they're backhauling it to an appliance in the cloud, so they don't have to manage it. That means that the, uh, the customers are not racking and stacking their own boxes, but fundamentally, all that's really happened is moving the appliance from on-prem to in the cloud. And in fact, that creates even some worse dynamics because it introduces more performance issues uh, and, and the idea of trying to marry this, this idea of just getting the benefits of cloud through management is not enough. As I just mentioned, the idea of having a real cloud-based security solution is leveraging all the data opportunities, leveraging the super scalable multi-tenant architecture so that customers, wherever they are in the world, wherever your employees are around the world, will always connect to the nearest data center and get quickly out to the internet where policies uniformly applied before they do so. Uh, and that's pretty different from just having an appliance you move into the cloud. There are unquestionably some management benefits, but I don't think those come close to being able to, uh, to trump a, a truly cloud-based solution. Uh, and, you know, if you think, if I look at our company here and the talent that we have here, we really have operational expertise. We've been running OpenDNS, which is now the largest uh, recursive DNS service in the world. Uh, I think we're now handling about 50 billion DNS requests a day. And we, the reason we're able to do so and do it without downtime is that we have seven years of operational expertise and infrastructure expertise built into our service. And so we know how to carry traffic, we know how to run globally distributed services, uh, and you know, as a result, we're able to run those kind of infrastructures just like an ISP would, and that's really how we treat carrying traffic, it's just like an ISP. Uh, it's the same reason why we wouldn't build appliances. We don't know anything about shipping metal boxes, uh, and I think the same is true when you think of appliance-centric vendors. Their engineering, their release structure, their QA, everything is, is, is sort of focused around you know, shipping out a release, shipping it out on a metal box, and shipping it out to the customer. We're running a 24-7 service, man. We push out code dozens of times a day, and we have processes in place to make sure we do so reliably. So this takes me to Umbrella, which is uh, you know, the sales pitch of, of this presentation. So we, we built Umbrella to capitalize on this opportunity where we felt that people needed to be able to extend the benefits of an appliance, but really to the cloud where traffic is really happening uh, and to be able to support these nomadic and roaming workers. Uh, the idea is that we want to have a service that works on any device, so Mac, PC, uh, iOS, Android. And right now we have Mac and PC and iOS and Android's in development. Uh, and I, I'm expecting a beta will be out this quarter. Uh, we want to make sure that we have one web-based management portal where you can manage all your devices, whether it's through Active Directory or just by mobile phones and roaming laptops on a per group, per user basis, and have it be applied uniformly everywhere. And one of the cool things of having a cloud-based service is that you can have location-aware policies. So you can have a policy that applies to your, uh, maybe your West Coast offices or your European offices, and then you can have a separate policy applying to the iPhones and uh, Android devices or your Mac and your PC. Uh, and then you, when you have those policies, you're able to then order them and rank them and say, look, I want, not, you know, I want phones to have a certain policy all the time that blocks malware and botnets, but I want my offices physically to have content filtering enabled. So you can have different, that way when the phone comes onto the office, you can have the office policy trump the phone policy, and then when that phone is maybe at home or roaming, you can have the policy be different, depending on where the, the employee is. In a world where people are using their own devices, we think that the idea of having contextual and location-aware security policies is really a requirement. The idea that policies are static and tied to devices or tied to users doesn't make a lot of sense when you might want to have a different policy depending on where the user is. We hear from customers quite frequently that they want to have a more rigorous content filtering policy applied under the corporate network than they do when the users are working from home or at Starbucks or on the road. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. Nonetheless, they want to have security be applied everywhere. Maybe they want logging to be turned on in one place and logging to be turned off in another place. All those things require you to have really dynamic contextual uh, security policies, and those are things that are afforded by a cloud-based solution. 